Good afternoon, folks. My name is Alex, and this is episode 10 of the Shall I Barn series. And this week is going to be about adapting to probably the most common injuries that we get that affect uh, barn playing. And I, I went online and I asked a few drummers in Toronto about issues what they have with, with drumming, and some of them are daft drummers, and some of them are djembe players, and some of them are kit players and whatnot. And two of them are Bowron players, and they gave me a big long list of things, and there were, I think, about six or seven that came up as the most common. So I want to talk specifically about the most uh, common uh, injuries that they've been talking about, and sort of what to do with it. But uh, just as a quick disclaimer, um, I'm not advocating playing while you're injured. I mean, there are serious injuries out there where, you know, as strong as the hand can be, there's a lot of intricate little bits to it, and, and it's so important to realize the fingers to wrist, to the forearm, to the elbow, and to the shoulder. All of that stuff is connected somehow, and depending on how badly you've injured it, you can actually make it worse by playing. So I'm not advocating for you to go out playing while injured. Don't be tough. Uh, be smart. And try to uh, you know, consult physicians, your doctor, etc., and just common sense if you're wrist is really inflamed you don't play <laughs> so uh, don't say I didn't warn you uh, and uh, hopefully what I'm what we're generally looking at more so is like a more of a long-term injury thing or something where it's only part of the problem and how to get around some of those aspects of, of, of playing uh, with with uh, an injury so the first one on my list here and if I'm looking off camera it's because my list is on a separate screen <laughs> Uh, the first one is uh, finger injuries, and I used to get tons of finger injuries, but thankfully I don't play the sticking hand with my left. However, finger injuries did keep me out of playing uh, guitar a lot. So I used to play a lot of guitar. I popped one knuckle right out and shoved it back in, and next day I had a giant hand. <laughs> and I've damaged these fingers to do you know, years of martial arts or just to work or slipping and falling or whatever and I've had a few finger injuries and well it matters and the fingers are so important because they're the things that grip generally speaking in most grips you know they're the things that provide that extra strength the finger and the thumb thumb really being the key um, if you're having a lot of finger pain joint pain and whatnot and this goes with any sort of joint pain try the glucosamine stuff tablets whatnot try the glucosamine rubs try the arthritic medications or the anti-inflammatories aspirin is a good one too uh, or naproxen um, which is more for muscles but if you're still having issues with fingers like if you're a much older player or whatever um, you can get around it especially if you're using if you used to use the more of the pen style grip which requires more force on the fingers you're, you can do a few things. Number one, relax more when you're playing. A lot of people grip really, really tight. It's not about that. It's about being loose. Be loose. You just want the sticking hand to hold the stick loosely, but but securely, so that you can, you know, knock out. To maneuver better than gripping really really tight. It's the same thing when you go and you're writing things with a pen. You don't want to grip really really tight. You'll just end up getting muscle cramps and finger pain. Um, but if you're actually finding that this is really and truly quite painful or annoying, then you may want to try the different types of baby grips out there. You know, the deep inset baby grip only requires the thumb. It's doing all the work of holding it. It's doing all the work of holding the stick inward. Sometimes other types of baby grips, you're ending sort of securing it differently. You're not putting as much force like the pen grip, and you can you can be more relaxed when you play, and you can you can hold more loosely. So you're putting a lot less pressure on the fingers and tendons, things. That might actually be more realistic. Is just to change up how you're playing. Um, Generally speaking, finger injuries are more rare, but they pop up here and there, and I've had a few of them as well, even in the sticking hand that were very temporary, but uh, 
you know, it was, if, especially if you're new to playing and you're gripping really, really tight and you're finding some grips and sticks very difficult to use, you might actually find it easier to uh, relax more and try different, try different hand position. Could be as simple as that. Um, wrist injuries are the ones that I hear the most of, um, from whatever reason, falls, impacts, impact damage, um, RSI or inflammation. Um, obviously treat the swelling as you normally would, whether doctor recommended or, or, or if you have a household remedy, go ahead, do it. Um, you know, ice your wrist beforehand, but if you're icing before and after, then maybe you should be stopping altogether for a little while until it's healed up. Um, one thing I find really helpful is to warm up, you know, uh, just when you start off playing, just relax and just, just go over some basic stuff and get all the stuff warmed up. Whatever it is that you like to do. And get all of this warmed up. You know, nothing's worse than gunning a cold engine and you end up risking more damage. Do so. Take your time. Stretch things out. Stretch your hands out. Roll your wrist out a little bit. Do what it is that you feel is going to loosen you up. Um, another thing you may want to consider doing is getting a wrist band. And the wrist band just holds the wrist and gives it extra support, maybe some extra compression that is quite useful. Um, if you're finding that you're that you don't want to play with the bent wrist. I know a lot of people are not too big on playing with the bent wrist. Get something that holds the wrist straighter, those wrist guards, and then that'll allow you to adjust accordingly, maybe with more of the shoulder and the arm rather than bending of the wrist. You know, it, it, it takes time to learn and rather relearn the things that you had already learned and adapt takes time to adapt but you can do it and for a little while you'll just save your wrist the extra strain until it heals up and you can start going back to how you prefer to play or you might find that you'll diversify your set of playing skills um, another good way of taking pain off the wrist is instead of playing at the sort of more well-known double-ended way of playing is try it the Tommy Hayes method which is turning it upside down and instead of instead of twisting the wrist so much, you're actually doing more with the fingers. The fingers are doing more of the work. It has almost no pressure on the wrist. There's almost no real motion on the wrist itself. It's all just from the fingers. has almost no pressure on the wrist. If you are putting pressure on the wrist, you're, you're, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and you are, you should never really feel that sort of feeling on the wrist unless you're trying to do some of the more advanced stuff. Where you're really trying to crank it because then you can really turn the wrist, but it's mostly just from the fingers. And it's also a big waste of energy to throw in the wrist too much in that sort of playing. So try the Tommy Hayes method. Some people out there already have expressed that they like using it and find it more natural for their skills to use. So great, go with that. Chances are you're probably not going to have a wrist injury in the future from playing like that. Uh, moving down the list, we got tendon damage in the forearm or muscle issues in the forearm. And if you're using the baby grip a lot, that's where most of your power is coming from. At least that's how I feel it. Um, that can be a bigger issue. Uh, usual muscle relaxants and painkillers are helpful, but if it's tendon damage, then there's a problem. Tendons leading up into the, uh, up and past the muscle. That's a problem. That you got to stop. I don't have answers for that. You got to get the tendon thing looked at first. Um, but as far as dealing with just the soreness in the muscles, um, you may just have to play, but play less. You know, there's that matter of st maybe stretching it out a bit rather than trying to go full bore with a very intense amount of time. So if you like playing a lot at sessions, maybe play one out of every three and, you know, rest up in between. Uh, 
Tendons also don't heal like muscles. Muscles require extra damage to grow and heal. Tendons are a bit different in that regard. Um, they're also, as strong as they are, they're also more delicate. And if you get RSI um, dealing with this, you got to treat the RSI first. Um, sometimes there's no way around it. You just have to stop. Uh, tendon damage is a serious issue. Muscle damage is one thing because the muscles will heal typically faster, but tendon damage, tendon damage is, you know, once that mobility is removed, that mobility is removed forever unless you get surgery on them. So be careful with that and be careful with uh, any sort of tendon injury that you sustain. Um, a good way around a lot of this is again the thumb lock method of playing because you're you're using this in here rather than a whole lot through here. That just takes a lot of energy away from that wrist muscle. Or sorry, from the wrist muscle, from the forearm muscle. It's harder to control. Don't get me wrong. This is a harder thing to control because now you got to start thinking about localizing your fine motor skills rather than thinking about it as a muscle twitch. Um, it, the thumb lock method basically isolates that motion into one local area, so you don't have to worry so much about stress on that on the arm muscles. Um, Cut, cuts and abrasions, basically finger damage. Um, again, the baby grips seem to be the best way around that. Uh, the pen grips can be not very kind, but the, uh, the baby grips, again, by and large, you're not necessarily gripping on the pads, you're gripping on the inside of the parts of the fingers that get cut less often. Uh, they're also slightly less sensitive than the very tips, but Again, you know, the inside lock, where you're not actually touching it with fingers themselves. Again, that seems to be really, really helpful. And I find that the inside lock take on the baby grip gets around a lot of these injuries by isolating, because so much of the motion is actually found in the muscle right here. Then you start getting into other stuff. You know, like that triplet there. You can create the same thing with the thumb lock as well. You know. Yeah. So there are ways around it. The thumb, I just find, is sort of like a second brain in, in that sort of connection. It can process separately because it has this sort of motion, not this sort of motion. So you can have this and this. You can twist it or you can start throwing it out there or just on its own. You know, like the fingers, you can just have that little extra bit of motion. Um, consistent and persistent cramps and pains and tingliness. Water. Drink lots of water. Uh, water is so key to keeping muscles in balance and to keep yourself from getting excessive cramping. Uh, usually, from what I understand, cramping has a lot to do with diet. And again, not getting enough water, not having a, a, a good sort of all-around diet for playing. Um, not, you know, less to do with damaged muscles, more to do with habitual things. Um, cramping can also come from overworked muscles. So if you're getting extra pain and, and you're getting times where everything kind of goes like this, you get like that, that sort of quick little pain drink more <laughs> literally like have a beer have some pop have a glass of water sit and wait for about 20 minutes or an hour or whatever then go start practicing again and it does make a difference water is the stuff that lubricates your body basically and uh, keeps your muscles firing on even uh, so it, it does it does make a big difference also like cramping and stretching you actually may want to avoid stretching in some regards. In some uh, fitness instructors will tell you that stretching versus not stretching, you know, these are tendons, they're not muscles. And if you're getting muscle cramp versus the tendon issue, 
if you're stretching tendons, you generally may just want to do it lightly to relieve pressures, but stretching them in general isn't a very good idea. And the reason being is you think about these things like rubber bands and you stretch them and they'll come back. But if you stretch them way too much, you tend to lose a fair bit of elasticity. Um, and if you stretch them incorrectly, you end up losing elasticity because it needs time to repair in between. So if you stretch too much, then, then you don't wait the appropriate amount of time. You actually can do longer lasting damage and actually create bigger issues. You'll get a bigger mobility, but you won't have the same sort of strength in that same part of the body. You know, really good examples of that are people who are in the martial arts who are trying to develop the splits or to do high kicks and they have a way of developing slow stretching over the course of months and months to get to that point. And they'll do it according to diet and they'll do it according to uh, training regimens. They won't just stretch really, really hard. Stretching really, really hard is just going to cause more damage than you already have. Um, again, like I keep coming back to the thumb lock thing. Um, I find that the thumb lock and the baby grip to be great ways of getting around uh, a lot of the cramping because you're, you're you're not gripping as hard. And again, really important, don't grip super hard. Super hard grips are spending so much energy being put into the grip that everything tenses up. And when something is really, really tense, you can't flow very well. You know, If you're a person who likes to box and you're really, really tight and you try to throw a fast punch, it's not. It's very, very hard to throw anything fast when you're tense. If you're relaxed, you can kind of relax. You can just fleck them out there. Boom, boom, boom. And it's the same thing when you're playing. If you're really, really tense, it can be a bit... It becomes... You can do it, but it's really awkward, and it's very... Uh, your whole system of fingers through the shoulder, they don't work very well. Whereas if you're relaxed and you're, you're more chill... speed and you develop accuracy it's more to do with how to control things with playing rather than being you know, super buff about the whole thing or being super flexible it's less to do with that than it does to do with practicing technique and treating your body well um, so yeah we got the water oh yeah you ever thought that maybe it's the tipper that you're using Sometimes tippers are really cool, and then you go and you get one, and you try it, and your brain says, I like this, and your body's saying, I don't like this, especially if you're playing something very heavy or off counterweighted. And not this, this is hickory, this is very light. But when I was develop when I was cutting these back, I tried a bunch of different lengths and found that in some cases it actually hurts the grip on my hand. So I settled with a much shorter sort of grip. Um, I find the same thing whenever I'm, you know, making a type of tip. Where I try to I try to make it so that it's comfortable for me, rather than trying to press too hard into taking a tipper that I know feels wrong. I know what it is that I like. You know, getting a good tipper and letting something feel good, if it feels good, you're going to be immediately better when you start playing because it's already suited for you. If you're going to play something really, really heavy, like a big ball and tipper that's made of good solid wood, it may look very impressive, but it is not impressive because it actually is going to harm you in the end. Think of it this way. If you're just starting to get into fitness, you're not going to strap on the 40-pound weight vest that some people will when they go running and working out. You're not going to do that right away. You're going to build up to that. Or you're not going to start off with 100 push-ups. You're going to start off with 10. You know, you're not going to run five miles, you're going to run one mile. You're not going to do a thousand sit-ups. You're going to do 10 or 20 of them. And you're going to eventually going to work your way up and work your way up and work your way up. You have to be conditioned to excel. And if you're not conditioned, you run the risk of causing all sorts of hell to happen in your body. Ball and elbow. 
like tennis elbow. And yes, it is not the same thing. But some people, for some reason, and I have not been able to research why, so maybe someone else out there in internet land knows why, um, is bar and elbow. People playing and they end up getting a pain and I don't know too much about it and maybe again maybe you people out there could enlighten me more on this but they're getting a pain right on the top on the outside of the elbow here and they're getting it and they're getting it from this sort of motion here when they're playing and it also comes from what I understand people who are a little too over enthusiastic when they start playing and put too much movement into it and they're really throwing it like they're really throwing motions the only thing i could come up with is either that they already have an existing injury that is you know being accelerated from playing or that there is something that there, there's an alignment issue in that case you might want to check out an mat a muscle activation therapist or a chiropractor or something someone like that who knows more about the alignment of joints rather than you know playing uh, playing drummer or, 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 or your general practitioner doctor you may want to consider that you may have pre-existing injuries and let's be honest bodies are imperfect there are going to be issues with joints I mean no one's arms are perfectly the same length no one's legs are completely the same length everyone is a little imperfect you know I got one eye I think it's this one that's higher than this one. And I know that this shoulder is lower than this one. So I'm actually kind of like slanted, like a 1980s house, <laughs> slightly on one side. And that's just, just how it is, it's just how it is. And that's how other people might want to start looking at themselves is that you're actually symmetrical, but you're quite asymmetrical at the same time. So you are going to have little things. You are an imperfect creature with imperfect joints. And imperfect fingers and imperfect issues imperfect issues and these sorts of things will come out in playing if you don't address them um, and there's some things you can't you can't change I mean, there are things in your body that if you can't change it you can't change it um, the only thing I could think about with bar and elbow uh, with joints or otherwise pain that you're getting is actually not from this side but from this side the side that cups the drum. And this is what I thought. Right now, six inch and five inch drums are very popular. The deeper the drums are sort of more popular these days. And if you're a person with a short arm span and you're, you got yourself a drum that's maybe a little too big, guess where that's pressing right into a major section of blood flow because there are veins that run right up to the surface, major arteries that run up to the surface. And if you start applying pressure there and playing and you're hugging too tight, you're actually going to be slowing the blood flow in your arm. And that can put pressure on the elbow as well. And it can cause pain in the forearm and it can cause pain in the wrist and pain in the fingers. You know, you can get some pretty serious pain and injury. Also, depending on how deep it is, the ability to slide your hand around to make noises are all going to be based partially or they're all going to be based to some degree on simply anthropometrics or how the human body fits the environment this is a little 14 inch drum I have a grip that easily covers the entire inside of this drum but if I had if I took my 18 inch drum and if it was seven inches deep that would be a problem because that's literally like this on me and now I have a problem because my arms aren't long enough. You have to be fairly knowledgeable in your own dimensions, your own proprio-sensory, where you are in rel relation to your local space when you're playing in order to help ease a lot of your pain. Most people can play smaller instruments. They fit everyone. Not everyone can play big instruments. And if you love playing super deep, super big drums, make sure you buy one that you can play with your own range of motion. If you do not listen to your range of motion, you're not getting the most out of the instrument and you are certainly going to, over time, cause a real dislike of your body towards that instrument because it doesn't fit it. 
you're going to be doing things on how to play it that's not going to be very helpful, at least in contemporary playing, contemporary modern playing. So maybe that's part of the problem. A big problem is when you get people who are too short trying to buy drums that are too big, and then you get the issue of this. And this goes straight to the shoulder blade, and then you start getting pain in the shoulder, the shoulder blade, and the elbow. You know, and if the drum's too deep, it goes right to the fingertips due to lack of blood flow. So that is a bit of an issue. Ways around it, plain and simple. Maybe a shorter tipper is the wrong answer. Maybe a longer tipper is an answer. Maybe the carry method of playing isn't going to work. Maybe what you need is to sit back a bit and develop effort to try single end playing. And maybe changing the tipper, changing your playing style, or if you're on the ballroom buy and sell, sell your drum to get money to buy a drum that's better suited for you. I know that can be a real hassle, especially if you love the drum that you have, but you know your health is more important than the, the drum and your ability to play, because you want to play until you get into your ripe old age, right? Um, that matters more than having something that you can't play. If you can't play it, you can't appreciate it well. Uh, and you're certainly not going to have as much fun looking at it as you will playing it. So those are the big six that at least I've looked at in the past week. And, you know, thanks to uh, uh, the people who have contributed to offering ideas on how to get around some of these problems. And thanks to my family doctor. Uh, who actually partook in, in part of this, and thanks to uh, a few other drummers who I've interviewed uh, during the week who were you know, happy enough to sit with me over a coffee and discuss injuries and common injuries and how to treat common injuries. So yeah, a lot of the times it's how you're treating your body, what it is that you're playing and its dimensions, your body's relation to the space that it's playing, and of course, what it is that you're playing. So. Who knows? Try to find something comfortable for you. Have a good week, folks. Take care.